Okay, I see a number of you have had a chance to, to, uh, to talk to each other, and hopefully you've had a chance to talk in the IM window also. Um, I'm going to uh, move on a little bit and just go over some of the, some of the other events that we're having over the course over the next week, week and a half. We have two more events next week. Uh, one is uh, the third in a series with Howard Knopf. Uh, he's going to be talking about behavioral interventions that you can use for challenging students. And he's been talking about classroom management. This should be a really interesting session with a lot of practical tips on students who have been giving us all the most trouble. Um, and it's another one where it's going to be very interactive and so you can bring up your own challenges or your own solutions and share them with, with everybody else. And then on November 10th, uh, we're going to have uh, Anne McMullen, who's uh, talking about uh, how we all, all of us as educators, are natural change agents and how to fine tune our ability to lead change, uh, but with our students, with our students' parents, with our schools, and with our districts. Um, and so that she's actually going to be talking about that at FETC as well. And then the following week, uh, we have uh, Beatrice Arneas. Uh, Beatrice is the ed tech director for Houston ISD. And uh, they spend a lot of time looking for re um, OER resources for their teachers. So she's going to be explaining how she finds her best resources and some of the ways that uh, you can access either the same resources that Houston uses or, or uh, find and your own resources or establish a similar program to what Houston established. So those are, th are three events that are coming up over the next uh, two weeks. And, and I guess really without further ado, I'm going to bring up uh, Fred, who's the Assistant Director of Curriculum and Instructional Services at uh, one of the BOCES in New York, and who is an ASCD author and has the uh, book uh, Professional Development That Sticks. Um, so let me close this and bring Fred up. Fred. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. Yes. Why, thank you. So um, first, thanks for, uh, so, thanks for being so, here. Um, so how do you like it? So the Mets, Mets did really well. Yeah, and the Mets did really well last night, right? The Mets won, didn't they? Oh, no, it wasn't the Mets. It was <laughs> yeah, Chicago. They did. They did. And the, <laughs> they did win, yes. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, some of us were up a little late last night watch, watching that. So um, it was, I have to say, it really was an exciting game. Okay. But, um, but that's off topic. Um, and I guess the best thing that I could do is get out of your way and uh, run this, right? Sure. So um, thanks, Mitch. I wanted to, uh, to thank you for um, the great introduction. And... Um, sharing a little bit about EdChat Interactive and um, what, uh, what your team and group put together. And so uh, first, I want to thank you all for, for joining on this Thursday evening. I know it's certainly uh, not quite like the last game of the World Series, um, nor uh, quite like all the election coverage that we're getting, though probably, I would guess, this is much better than, um, than that. But um, one of the uh, great things about um, hosting a webinar with EdChat Interactive is that uh, we get to utilize a portal that actually holds to a lot of um, what good professional learning is all about. And this Shindig platform um, is a really great platform for us to talk about professional learning. Because really, in effect, what it does, and you may have even realize this as you've started working and um, kind of tooling around with um, the portal as we started this evening, is that it lets you connect with people virtually in a way that's very different. And to come back to professional development in general, one of the things that's really important that we have to keep in mind is that professional learning really needs to be about the learner, right? And so um, if we want any type of learning to make a difference. It has to really stick for the people who are going to be involved. And that's really what I'm going to um, be chatting with you a little bit about this evening. As Mitch mentioned, I had uh, joined and chat interactive um, 
during last spring. And during that time, I um, had given a, a brief overview of um, the book that I had written for ASCD. And today is actually the first of what I hope, if, um, if Mitch and team are willing to uh, bring me back, the first of um, what will be three of these EdChat interactives that will kind of blow up the, the three phases of really strong professional learning design, as I see it. So um, you'll see my information on that first slide. Um, please feel free to reach out to me. I am an avid Twitter user. I provided you with um, two different email addresses. And then at the bottom, you'll see um, a link to my website where I have some of the writing that I'm currently doing, uh, as well as some of the work that I've put together uh, um, for my organization. So Mitch, if you don't mind advancing, that would be great. So I'm going to... Um, quickly just share a little bit about my story with you. I'll give you the quick uh, one or two minute um, uh, kind of summary. So I entered um, education 15 years ago. I was a middle school science teacher and department chair for 10 years. And I realized during that time um, how different professional development could be um, in any given day, week, month. I could have a phenomenal learning session and then within my same uh, sometimes even led by the same person have a session that felt like it had no connection to me and um new york state is a state that has a number of um you know what are commonly referred to as reeses regional educational service agencies in new york they're called boces i work for one that's a little north of new york city and um along with providing supports around special education, career and technical um, assistance, we also have a thriving curriculum and professional development department. An opportunity uh, arose for me to move into a regional role, providing support around science to districts in my region and moved into that. And then found myself um, moving into a much broader role, looking at curriculum design and professional learning across the content areas for roughly 30 districts uh, in the northern suburbs of New York City. And so in that work, I began to really understand some of the nuances that exist to, to designing professional development that really um, meant something to people. And the picture in the bottom left, um, I had the opportunity to do some work uh, with the Gates Foundation around redesigning and rethinking professional development. And all that led to me um, putting together a book for ASCD called Professional Development That Sticks. And it's really meant to be a practical guide on um, considerations that we should all keep in mind when we are tasked with uh, designing professional learning for others or even for ourselves. Uh, and then the picture to the right, those are just my two girls. And for me, um, you know, that's that's really the reason why professional learning is so important. Because as educators, if we feel invested in the learning we're doing, we're much more likely to help our students feel invested in what they're learning as well. So Mitch, if you don't mind uh, transitioning. So, you know, we don't want to operate from a deficit model, right? So we're going to get kind of the negatives out of the way first, and then we'll focus more on building up during the rest of uh, our time together this evening. But here are some of really kind of six reasons why um, we tend to find ourselves in a position where uh, our staff or our colleagues aren't as invested in professional learning as they could be. And I'll give you a second just to look at those. And very likely you've experienced all of these uh, at the same time, right? Sometimes that, that happens, or one. And it's made you wonder a little bit about um, the structure of our professional. So Mitch, uh, if you advance. So um, one thing that you may not know about me, uh, but you will now, is that I'm a tremendous geek. If it's science fiction or anything related to, um, to science-y, comic, booky, gamey type stuff um, in there. So as I was doing my research for the book, um, you know, I, I no doubt made a connection to the Justice League. And, and so in order to make change and move away from those six kind of deficit model items, um, we can rely on research from folks like Gusky, the DeFores, Teacher Development Trust, and kind of highlight 
what I like to think of as, of the Justice League of Professional Development Design. And these are seven ideas or practices that if we do them in our professional development design work, um, the folks who are our learners are mucky feeling as if the learning is really meaningful for them. And so these I do wanna spend just a second on, I, I, and they should make sense, right? If the learning is individualized for people, um, if it's truly engaging, if it requires accountability, right? If we get away from the one and done method of professional development to workshop series or constant follow-up and check-in, um, if it's applicable to the role people have and it's based on people's voice, right? The, um, the learning isn't created solely by the principal or the assistant superintendent of instruction. People who are going to be involved in the learning are also involved in the design. All of these items help to foster professional learning design that really makes a difference for people. So, uh, Mitch, you can move on. So, in my work, I, I took that research by those phenomenal educators and researchers, and I started to think a little bit about how we can encapsulate all of that. So, sure, the Justice League, uh, you know, and, and comics are a great reference point, but I also thought back to some of the work done by Malcolm Gladwell and um, in his book, The Tipping Point, uh, he talks about this idea of stickiness, you know, and, and one of the things he writes in the book is he wonders um, when we're dealing with something, is the message memorable? And in fact, is it so memorable that it causes us to move forward with change and actually makes us take action? Right? And that's really what sticky learning is all about. We've designed it in such a way that it doesn't just bounce off of us. It has such a critical impact on the work that we do that we are actually ready to take the risk and change our practice. And that's what we really want to do with professional development design. Okay, Mitch. So what, what I came to through that work and through looking back on my own experiences was this idea that it's, our work needs to be much more than professional development. We need to make sure that it's professional development for learning. Now, semantics maybe, but adding that L to it is very critical for me because it makes me remember that it's not just sharing of information. It's helping people come to an understanding of their own so that they can then change the work that they do. And so I realized that I could break up the design process into three different phases. Planning, okay, and that's really the before the event. The providing, we most often think about when we think of a professional development opportunity. And then the following up, what we do afterwards. So let's move on, Mitch. So I'd like you to take your first opportunity to get together and, and, and chat. And so you can form a group of two or three, or if um, we've got four folks in here and you want to form a, um, a quad, we can do that too. And what I'd like you to do is take the next couple minutes to just talk about these three questions. What sticks in your current professional learning scheme and what doesn't? So when you think of your organization now, uh, what works for you, okay, and what isn't working? Which of the three phases of professional learning does your organization have a handle on? Are you very good at providing professional learning? Are you not as good as the planning that leads up to the event? And then what aspect of professional development planning, which is what we'll focus the remainder of our time together on this evening, what aspect of planning? Are you most okay? We're back. So, so I, if you had to guess, you know, of the of all the schools, um, you know, the fifteen thousand districts or how, however many districts there are, and however many schools there are, what do you think is are the the biggest things that don't stick in professional development? So I think I think a lot of it is actually. Um, well, I would, I would pick two, uh, let's say three. 
and I don't want to get too far because you know we can we can go down a whole bunch of different rabbit holes, and I'd actually like to hear right. from yeah. um, a couple folks about what they talked about, Mitch. But I would say that yes. um, actually, so, so you know, one speak? thing would be uh, I, yeah, we could. We could reserve that question, and you know, it'd be actually it'd be much more interesting. You're right to hear from some of the other people, and I saw you were having a, a good discussion with Carol. So I'm wondering if Carol or somebody else would click on the raise hand button and come up and talk to you about some of these these questions. Uh, so Carol, um, would you terribly? You know, it's fun. Um, you'll really enjoy it. Uh, maybe you can click on the raise hand button, or if somebody else can, and just talk about some of these things with Fred. So I think it uh, and, it was it was yeah. Judy who I was chatting with. So Judy, I'm sorry, Judy, anybody I'm sorry, can Judy, come on. Right. So um, well, in the meantime, while people are trying to find that raise hand button. <laughs> uh, Maybe you oh, can just sure. go through what you you think are some of the biggest the biggest things that's uh, uh, you know that doesn't stick in professional learning or professional development with, with today. Sure. So I would say one of the um, one of the biggest challenges is that often the format we use for the learning doesn't really match um, <clears throat> how best people would be learning. And I'm a firm believer in the fact that I don't really think there are any bad ways to provide professional learning um, people need what they're there for and the audience as a whole so i think that's a lot of times a big mismatch i think another thing that we mm -hmm. do that um doesn't work well is the one and done kind of format of professional development right so oh, you right, bring in right. somebody with a lot of expertise um they share their expertise with the group and then people are kind of left um to do their own way and um, figure out the learning for themselves. And that's a challenge because without that accountability we need, um, mm -hmm. it's unlikely for things to really make us um, get better. So those would be my two. Okay, all right. Um, so so this time, I don't think I wanna scare anybody, you know, and just, just kind of, you know, bring them up yeah. here without their permission so sure. um so let's so let's let's go on uh and Perfect. maybe somebody will brave this because um oh uh, yeah <laughs> uh so i just I, I texted somebody who's here and yes um yes i was talking to you to to find out if if you'd be willing if you're sure that you don't want to come up but uh, but you don't have to this you don't have to at all you don't have to this time uh, we'll go on with the slides but maybe next time uh, you can come up. It's really a lot of fun. Uh, Fred's a Fred's a great guy to talk to. So I'm uh, okay. I'll stop my break. I'll, I'll uh, um, but I'll, uh, I'll I'll come down um, and and bring your slides up. Sounds great. So the um, as Mitch is doing that, the great thing about the Shindig tool is that it provides you with um with an opportunity to have those conversations. So I had the chance to uh, to chat with Judy and she was talking a lot about um, learner agency, right? And um, really the necessity for any learner, whether they're a young learner or an adult learner to, um, to be, you know, I, I hate to use buzzwords, but it's a great one, right? To, to have people buying in um, to, to whatever the work is that's um, that's taking place. And that's hugely important, right? And so what's great about Shindig, you, you can have those conversations and then you can bring other people up so it doesn't just have to be me um, chatting at you, which is such a problem um, in general when we think of webinars. So Mitch, I'm just gonna mention something to you before I have you um, advance the slides. Uh, Wendy just wrote that she's getting a lot of feedback and um, everything seems to be repeating twice. Wendy, um, you know, you can type right into the uh, the box whether that's still okay. happening. So, so Wendy, you're in a co conference right now um, with um, with another person, and if the two of you split up, then the feed I see it looks like the two of you might have split up. But if you do that, then the feedback should go away. Um, so I'll, I'll stop my broadcast and uh, and pull your slides back up. I hope that worked. Awesome. So let's see. Okay. 
And if you have any problems, use that um, use that text box. Also, too, I want to mention for those of you who are um, Twitter people, as um, as I am, feel free to tweet anything out to uh, the hashtag PD that sticks, and I'll type it into the chat box. And it can be questions, um, anything that lands well for you, as well as things that don't. And um, you know, I'll either try and get to it over the uh, the second half of our time together um, this evening, or after the fact, I'll uh, respond. And you know, I'm here to learn just as much from you as as hopefully you are you are from me. So, Mitch, we can um, we can go back to nation mode and advance. So, um, you know, the funny thing about most professional development design is that of the three phases, planning, providing, and following up, planning, the one we should always really be thinking about, uh, is the one that's often most shortchanged. Um, you know, we work with districts quite a bit to help them uh, design professional learning. And some of what ends up happening is we get a lot of calls, let's say, on... Um, you know, in the end of October, October 27th, you know, November 1st, to try and help um, put together a staff development day on um, election day. And that's a challenge, right? But what often ends up happening is there are so many other, um, you know, good things or bad things happening in our buildings and districts that um, professional development often gets kind of shifted to the side, uh, not because it it isn't important, but because in terms of the fires that need to be put out or other things that are on our agendas, um, it can be pushed to the side. And that's a problem, right? Because if we don't plan things, we're going to end up with um, the one and done type of professional development where we bring in somebody who might not be a good fit for our staff and we're going to bring everybody together when everybody doesn't need to be brought together. So um, they're really five key parts I found to excellent professional development planning. And we're going to take a look at these over the uh, next half an hour in a little more detail. And I'll leave you with some questions to think about, as well as provide you with some resources that I want you to take a look at. So uh, Mitch, let's move on. So one thing that we always need to consider when planning, and this, you know, for those of you that are involved in um, any type of strategic planning work. This one shouldn't come as a surprise, right? In any initiative that we're going to explore, there always has to, has to be a purpose or rationale. And it can't be a purpose and rationale that just matters to us. That's a recipe for disaster, right? So as we're planning professional learning, there are a number of questions we can ask. Here are three that are really important. Um, you know, first, why are we exploring this? Right. And I'm a big fan um, of the five whys protocol. It's a really simple, easy protocol to use that you can use with yourself. You can also use with your professional development uh, committee. If you're a building leader or district leader and you've got a cabinet that works with you, use it with them. And the idea is really simple. You ask yourself why. Okay, it could be a why about any type of question. Come up with an answer and then ask why again. And you give yourself about five levels of why. And what ends up happening is you end up usually drilling down to whatever the big issue is that you're trying to address. Sometimes it feels a little bit annoying. You know, how many times am I going to ask myself why? But often the first problem or question we ask ourselves doesn't really address the problem we really need to get to. Okay, what evidence do I have that this fills a need? In other words, uh, have I collected data from my staff, my students, that we need to be exploring this? Has anybody said anything about it? Do I see it in my observations of student learning, teacher instruction? And who is it designed for? It's incredibly rare that any professional learning opportunity will apply to everyone in our buildings or districts. It's just unlikely. We have people on different grades, we have people who are instructing in different subjects, and we have people who learn differently. So we need to figure out who this learning is going to best land for. And then realistically, in a perfect world, if we can make it happen, not subject everybody to the same learning. 
And so at the bottom, really, one great way to do it is to plan professional learning with a group of other people. It should never be something done in isolation. Okay? And it should never be something done just with administrative voice. Teachers, even students, depending on their age, should have a voice in what the learning looks like. Okay? You want to know whether things are landing for students? Ask them. And it'll be clear what their classes may be struggling with. So, and it's important too, you know, these have to be critical colleagues. It's always nice to have people join you who don't see things the way you do. Yes, it makes more work for you, but it's a great way to, um, to make the learning happen. And of course, you want to include somebody who's uh, a member of the anticipated audience for the work. Okay, Mitch. You know, I, I mentioned Judy and I were talking about um, learner agency, right? And one of the best ways to build agency is to give people voice. Okay, so it can be something as simple as survey data. It can be even simpler than that with conversations. So how are things going for you? What's, you know, what's working well uh, for your students so far this year? What isn't? And that helps you target the people who are going to be the ones that you need to work with. And then really, you have to realize that if you ask for feedback, okay, you need to welcome it and incorporate it as best as possible. That doesn't mean that every bit of feedback you get is going to um, find its way into the professional learning that you plan, but it does mean that you're going to take all feedback into consideration, even if it means we're getting feedback we don't want to hear. So Mitch, I believe, when he sent out the um, when he sent out the email today with access to the webinar, also shared some links for documents. Uh, there's two that I'd actually like you to take a look at for the next five or six minutes. Um, one is a, a planning framework called the TAR tool, and another is a tool that I've used to monitor learning. Um, both can be really useful in the planning process. And so what I'd like you to do is open them both up. Take just a, give yourself a, a minute or two of eye time to look at them. And then I want you to join up with somebody and talk a little bit about how these tools could promote planning. Um, what purpose do you think they serve? How could voice uh, be accessed from using documents like this? And then what value do you see in them? And where don't so I'm hoping that some of you are having good discussions and are going to be willing to come up and talk to Fred about them. Uh, I'll pull myself down and the slides back up and uh, soon we'll, we'll, we'll reconvene. So Mitch. Okay. Um, I guess I won't pull the slides up, but I'm yes. I'm actually going to quickly ask um, Wendy to come up um, because we had we had a great conversation, I, and I know we want to make sure okay. we we explore kind of that that third part. But Wendy had a okay, there she is. So welcome, Wendy. Um, Hi. I wanted to ask you if you would just ask that question that. Um, you had posed kind of at the end of our discussion because I think it's actually a question that we all struggle with and I think it also helps us get a a better understanding of the importance of um, us really planning and planning in advance as we think about professional learning. Um, okay one of the things that I think my school I'm sure others will struggle with is the purpose of you know what an in service day maybe um you know we have certainly i would say we have kind of three types of things that happen are we looking to build community are we looking to make announcements and are we looking to actually do any professional learning and by the time sometimes by the time we get through some announcements and some state or other you know requirements of this or that 
um, training, the amount of time we have left for real professional learning is sort of minimal. And the people who are planning it, I'm not sure which idea you want, um, are not necessarily the ones who have are to make something very meaningful, um, have enough time to be meaningful. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think there's think... competing um, challenges on those days. I would agree. And, um, you know, Wendy, you bring up a, a lot of phenomenal points and great questions. And I think they're, they're questions that, you know, it, as I mentioned, we don't, we don't have all the answers to, but I think what it does is it highlights the importance of us to really rethink our professional learning design and think a little bit differently about how we go throughout the process. And as you mentioned, the planning it's either done by people who are either A, aren't in charge, B, don't really have an understanding of people need, or C, are very removed from the process in general. So even if a lot of planning has been put into it, it doesn't seem that way or land well for the people who are actually sitting in the room. And that's a problem. No. I mean, my description of it is usually party planning for people who don't want to come to your party. <laughs> And in many ways, right. That's what yeah. that's what it ends up being. So I, I think that, it, it, you know, a key way to begin to address that is to rethink who those planners are. And a lot of times that is a bigger district decision and a commitment to changing what the learning looks like, which some districts aren't willing to make. And it requires change. But if we keep planning parties that people don't want to go to, um, then you're going to end up with parties that either aren't well attended or um, which don't really provide the gifts we want them to at the end. So that was a really good uh, description. So thanks, Wendy. I appreciate it. I want to um, I want to work through that last set of slides. So, and we can advance um, past that one, and we can go one more. Great. So, I know time is short, and I'm I'm hoping you'll um, and let's go back one, Mitch, if we can. I hope that you'll you'll hang with me for for maybe just a few minutes uh, after nine. But um, you know, I, I was talking to um, Deborah and Wendy about the um, the TAR framework and. Uh, Deborah brought up the fact that it's an interesting framework design, but without some real key guiding questions, uh, you know, it, it leaves things a little too open. And um, she's right. You know, that, that PAR framework is meant to help people organize their thinking. One of the things I realized in writing the book was professional development, at least for me, the design of it was too big for me to really manage just through those phases of providing or rather planning, providing and following up. So I had to put together kind of a, a, almost a map for myself. And so I, I came up with this kind of three-step process of thinking, acting, and reviewing. And regardless of whether you're planning, providing, or following up, you should be asking yourself questions that fall into each of these. And throughout the book, I ask a couple of these questions. So for instance, you know, to pull from some from the planning phase, things that you might want to think about. You know, a good thinking question. How do I determine the purpose of professional development for learning to guide my planning? An action step. You know, you might ask yourself, who is going to play a role in this professional development? And in terms of reviewing, looking back at your work, how do I make sure I've taken all the details into consideration as I finalize my plans? And so um, having a framework like TAR to work your way through is a, a really helpful one. And that other... Um, you know, what can I do now? What will I do soon? Okay, where do I end up wanting to go or what can I do yet? In a lot of ways, it's similar to the age old KWL, right? And uh, to kind of chart yourself, but from a planning perspective, it's really kind of helpful to think about the steps you need to take and who you'll need to get its assistance with in order to make things happen. So we can uh, move forward.
And uh, we've talked about those first two. We're going to spend just a few minutes looking at those other three. So let's move on. One of the uh, pieces I mentioned, you, you know, is that a lot of times uh, our professional development is provided in a form that doesn't really match the purpose. So a, you know, one hour sit and get type of professional learning experience might be okay if we're showcasing pure content, but if we're expecting people to model instructional moves, it's not going to work. And yet we often have forms of professional learning that don't really meet the purpose or rationale of the work we're doing. And so, you know, this picture of a gingerbread house on the slide, well, it is clearly a bread house with ginger inside it, um, but it's not what we visualize. It doesn't take the form that we think a gingerbread house should. And it's important that professional development for learning, the form and the function actually match. And again, I, I, want, to, I want to repeat that I'm, I don't believe that any form of professional development for learning is actually or inherently bad. But so much of our professional development is mismatched um, where the purpose and the form it takes don't match that we end up doing a disservice. And of course, it impacts who our facilitators are. I'm the first to say that I can't provide all types of professional learning well. Um, so if we know that the best way to reach people is through a certain method, we have to be willing to, to accept that. So let's move on, Mitch. There are also a lot of... Um, logistical items to keep in mind. The picture on the right, um, in the suburbs of New York, um, in a place called Croton, they do this jack-o'-lantern blaze every uh, around Halloween. So those are all the lanterns connected into a web shape. And when I look, was looking at that a couple of weeks ago, I was kind of struck by the connections that form in a web. Um, and you know, while not necessarily the most interesting part of professional development design, those six bullets, and they're not in really all we need to consider, but they're things that we have to keep in mind. You know, hey, what's the length of the school day? You know, when do we have in-service days like Wendy was talking about? Hey, what's the time of year? What do people have on their mind? What's the room and environment like? Does it tend to get hot at the end of the day so people can't pay attention? Is it too cold? So there's a lot that we need to keep in mind when we're talking about planning that goes beyond the actual pedagogical or instructional moves that we'll be using. And let's go forward, Mitch. And two, while we might not always think about it, um, feedback and data review play a tremendous part in planning, and they should. Right? How can we plan something without knowing what to base it on? We need to use data we've collected, whether it's summary data, whether it's quantitative or qualitative, to build the learning that's going to take place. If we're not looking at things to help us plan our professional learning, if we're not using any evidence, then we're, you know, it's taking the spaghetti, throwing it against the wall and hoping that something sticks. It's a dart throw, basically, right? So we have to use that data. Okay, Mitch. So I hope that you'll bear with me for, for another five or six minutes. I know we've hit nine o'clock, but I would like to, to be able to, um, to draw some closure. And I hope that your schedules will allow that. And if not, I understand, you know, a key part of professional learning is to always hold to time, right? So I'm already breaking that one rule. But I do hope you'll have five minutes. What I'd like you to do is um, there was one other document. It was a set of evaluations that I um, had shared. And I know that realistically you would need more than four or five minutes to really think about them. But I, these are evaluations airing from a recent workshop we held at our Okay. So uh, yeah, I know people didn't get as much time to discuss that time. So I'm, I'm sorry I kind of uh, jumped the gun a little bit. but. Um, you look like you were in a good discussion. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, you know, so I, I'm thinking a lot about um, 
both kind of the ideas for professional development design and then also this tool and learning in general, right? And I think when when you talk a lot about professional learning, you have to be cognizant of um, how you're facilitating yourself, right? And mm-hmm. picking out that are working and also not working. So one of the things that, um, you know, would be awesome to do and thinking about if, you know, restructuring this phase would be to find a way to have more than an hour's delve into it, right? Because as I was talking to um, to a few folks a little bit ago, you know, Wendy was saying there's not much we can really do with an hour's worth of learning. And again, Shindig is a great tool and it's awesome to be able to join up with people. But when you have these ideas that really lead you to think, I mean, I just joined Judy for a second and she was picking out some of the items from the evaluations where she was wondering, you know, here and, oh, this is interesting. Excuse me, that they said this. Um, it would just be great to have more time to delve into it. So I, I feel from that perspective, you know, it's so, a challenge. Yeah, so even from what we do at EdChat Interactive, what I'm looking to try in the spring is mini courses where we do a session like this and then people have a week or two weeks to do things and kind of maybe post videos or post something that they've done and comment on it each other and then in a week or two weeks have another session like this and, and move on. And I'm just curious to know if that's going if, if to be, if that's going to allow us to go deeper. Um, mm-hmm. It just, you know, because it's interesting. And Mitch, I, I know we're now coming up 10 minutes after nine. And um, is there an opportunity or does anybody have their hand raised to share anything? Or do we want to just... Uh, well, in the meantime, let me just publish the question uh, from oh, Karen. Okay. Uh, okay. hmm And I think, you know, to me, so um, for me, one of the things that I've done in the past, faced with, with a similar situation, is, you know, I've gone to the, the group that wanted me to do the professional development, and I said, look, you know, um, I'm... I'm Going to you know, I gave them my normal price for professional development, just basic based on what they wanted me to do. And I'm going to say, and then I said, but I think that I have a better way of doing it, which is going to take a little bit more time. I've got to talk to some of the people, and I'm you know, in the future we'll have to build this into the programs if you like it. But let me try it this way, and give me give me a couple people who I can talk to, and um, and they were okay with that because it wasn't costing them extra for the first one. So so they gave me people to talk to, and I was able to do much more planning in the professional development that I was doing, and it came off a lot better. And in future ones, I was able to build that time in. So that's mm-hmm. that's a possible option for, for Karen. I don't know. You probably have other ones. Yeah, no, I, I would agree. And I think, too, it's, you know, part of that is is about the, the relationships that are built with the district or school. And so having having information from that district or school way in advance would be really, really helpful to beginning to uh, address that, Karen, and to give you enough time, as Mitch was saying, to reach out to people and collect some additional data. Um, it's never a good situation when someone wants to bring you in uh, to explore a topic without much else that's kind of shared there, without an opportunity to build relationships with a district. A lot of times Mm -hmm. before we even have any of our consultants go out into districts, we have them provide a workshop or two regionally that are open to everybody. Mm -hmm. So the person actually gets to be known by some of the educators in our region and can begin to build relationships. Otherwise, it's it's just a really, really hard situation for anybody, Mm -hmm. regardless of how great a facilitator you are. So I can understand that. Okay. And, so, and as you said, if, if people want to discuss some of these things and, and the questions that you brought up before, uh, click on the raise hand button and we can bring you up to discuss them with, with Fred. I know we're um, 11 minutes over right now. Yep, we are. Um, so Mitch, to, to respect that and to try and stay under that 15 minute, you know, where you, you grab kind of like the, the, the cane or whatever it is and like pull me off the, uh, the stage. Let's just go through the um, the final few slides. And so, um, you know, those are kind of the five aspects of planning that I, I talk about in, in, in the book and explore. And, and really, if we're planning with a focus on purpose, we've built in voice from those who will be learning. 
we figured out um, how to design our professional development to really hold true to the rationale. We've considered the logistics and we've utilized data to actually and reflect on what things are going to look like. We've really gone through a, a good amount of pre-steps to getting to professional learning that really makes a difference. So let's uh, move ahead, Mitch. So I'd ask now if, if you've got any, any final questions related to planning or anything else that you'd like to, um, to toss out, uh, feel free to, to either um, raise your hand or uh, you can poke it into the room box or um, you can post it to Twitter and I'll get to it after we're done. Any questions? Great, so Mitch, let's just go ahead. So I wanted to provide you with my contact information. I'm gonna do a couple things um, when we're done. I'm gonna send out a, um, a quick survey that I put together um, to provide me with some feedback. What worked from this session? What didn't? Um, and then I'll use that if, um, if Mitch and company would like me to come back and, and chat some more. Um, I'll send that out to you. I'm also going to send out a link to everybody's email address that um, that was registered with the documents we looked at. So I'll, I'll provide you with a copy of this presentation. Um, feel free to utilize it or, or think of some ideas from it. And I'll also share the files that um, we took a few minutes to look at. You should feel free to contact me via email. Um, you know, at my phone numbers there, as well as Twitter. And the V is actually a tool called Voxer, which is a great tool um, really for critical friend work. It's almost like having a um, an answering machine that uh, allows you to, to share comments with other people and it allows you to put together a private group to discuss things. I've also provided two links to my book. Um, you know, I'm always looking for feedback. I, you know, I nowhere claim to be an expert in this, just someone who's had some experience and some information to share. So um, without any further ado, Mitch, I think we're, it's 914, so we're under that 15 minute cut. Good. Okay. So we'll definitely, we'll, you know, we'll definitely invite you back. Um, I think this, you know, is, is really, it's great information and, um, you know, I think I, I'm hoping that that all, all of you got a lot out of it as well. And, uh, you know, and thank you. Uh, look forward thank to you. seeing you this, this winter. Um, are you going to be at any conferences this winter? I am. I will be. Um, I'm going to be presenting regionally at a few places and then I'll be presenting um, at ASCD, the, na uh, the oh, cool. national conference in March. So okay. looking forward to that. Well, that should be great. OK, thank well, Fred, um, enjoy your evening. And, or the rest of it, okay. <laughs> and um, and 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 thanks again. This this was great. This was great. Thanks everybody. Um, and this is Mitch Weisberg. I'm signing off for EdChat Interactive. I hope to see you at a future event at www.edchatinteractive.org. And um, thank you for coming tonight. Goodbye. <laughs>